there's an old story about a, a child who goes to his, his mother and says, uh, I don't want to go to school today. And the mother says, well, why? She says, well, children aren't nice to me. Teachers don't like me. It's too much work to do. I, I just really think I'm, I have a stomachache. I don't really want to go today. And the mother said, well, honey, you're the teacher. <laughs> so it's the kind of problem we have is that um, how to nurture mindfulness in schools. I think probably many of you in this room are really concerned about the, the nature of education right now. Uh, at least if you aren't, you should be. We have a xenophobic focus on achievement and, and achievement testing as the measure of how good our education systems are. Uh, and uh, very little focus on the whole child and the, the idea of nurturing a children's full development to become a, 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 an adult with full potential. It's, it's a crisis, and we see the swing back and forth every five or ten years, and you see the, the process a little different in each society. Uh, I visit many countries and see how education is going, and uh, I know you have a new plan as of yesterday for Asian language. Wonderful, but I'd like to see a plan for the whole child, for how music, art, and literature uh, would create a child uh, and adults, citizens that are full participatory in our democracy and uh, have a great sense of self. And to me, uh, that's the, the fundamental goal of education. Uh, reading and maths are fine. They come along anyway when these other things happen, when children are engaged in learning. So what I want to do is talk today a little bit about some of the work we've been doing. I'm a, a sort of a nerdy scientist. Uh, like some of them here, and I'm interested in how can nurturing mindfulness support children's development. And so I'll talk a little bit about what, about what mindfulness is. I'll tell you about some studies we've done. Uh, there's going to be other speakers following me, doing, talking about their own fascinating work. I'm just giving you a little hint today. But nurturing mindfulness, I think, is part of a much larger domain we call social and emotional learning. Uh, there's a great deal of work on this in this field. If you're interested, you might go to castle.org, C-A-S-E-L.org, to learn more about it. Uh, there's uh, curriculums that are used in schools all around the world that we now know with uh, strong empirical evidence will improve children's uh, sense of self, their ability to pay attention in the classroom, their ability to get along with their friends, and to reduce problems later on like uh, drug abuse and other risky behaviors in adolescence. Uh, I myself am the developer of one of those programs that's now 32 years old. It's used quite a bit in Australia, especially in, in WA and some places in Victoria, called the PAS curriculum. And I've been working on that work for a long time, and mindfulness is now deepening that work, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how. The field of mindfulness is changing rapidly. Uh, 2005, there was no work at all, really, in the field of mindfulness and education. There were a couple of people doing some mindfulness work with children, but there wasn't a published article, really. So it's very new. Lots of new ideas coming to fruition quickly. That's great for a new field, a new scientific field. But it also means that practice gets ahead of science, and we don't know really what's working and what's not. And that's important. So there's still very little high-quality research. Uh, for those of you that are interested in all this, there are already review articles written. I've written them, and other people have. Uh, but mostly we conclude that this is a very promising idea, but don't put too much money on it yet till we see what the effects are over time. So conclusions I'm going to make today are quite tentative, and they should be because we want to be careful. Uh, when we invest in children's development and their education, we want to be accountable and know that the things we do actually make a difference. So mindfulness is everywhere these days, as you know, uh, even on the treadmill, <laughs> out in the in country. Ch children, mindfulness, and education is a very big field now. But uh, <laughs> why not for your animals? So it, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the ether these days, right? It's just something we see. But how can mindfulness and contemplative practices really nurture a meaningful change in education? What does it mean to have meaningful, deeper change in, in, in the development of children and adolescents? And I was uh, uh, honored to be involved, invited to be in, in a meeting with His Holiness in Dharamsala in 2000 that Alan Wallace was also at. Uh, uh, and it was called Destructive Emotions. It was about the issue of uh, how, do, um, how do children learn to regulate our emotions? How do we as adults learn to regulate our emotions? Uh, are certain emotions destructive? Uh, are there certain emotions that, as we've been talking about for the last day and a half, bring us towards uh, a fuller sense of realization and fulfillment? And how can we nurture those positive emotions, but also how can we regulate those emotions that are very difficult to handle? Uh, 
And of course, in this world, there's a great deal of concern about the negative emotions because we see the highest rate of problem we projected in the world of all chronic diseases is depression by 2020. Uh, and probably the most costly disease in some ways is depression. Uh, I work mostly with children that have higher risk behaviors of aggression and violence, but depression also comes with that because when you have bad outcomes over time, not only have you been aggressive, but you begin to become depressed about what, what the options are in your life. As a result of that work, uh, what well, His Holiness said to me in the middle of the meeting, I was telling him about social emotional learning and how we can improve children's uh, behavior and awareness of themselves. And I talked to him about how to, we teach children to regulate um, mostly difficult emotions like anger and, and sadness and frustration and disappointment and guilt and humiliation. And uh, he said to me, that's all very good work. In fact, he himself has written books with those titles like uh, How to Manage Anger. But he said, um, the mind is a muscle, and where it lies most of the time is what it will seek in the future. It's also like classic behavioral reinforcement theory in a way. Uh, and he said, um, so I'm interested in the problem of how much your time you're spending with children and helping them to understand and become more aware of and, and, and experience positive emotions. Because the more children experience these positive emotions, the more they seek them. So I thought, gee. I, I've missed the mark in some ways. I need to really work on a new way of thinking about my own work. And so over the last uh, decade, I and many people, some of them who are here, including my wife, Krista, who will be doing a workshop with me tomorrow, uh, have developed a, a group of uh, people at Penn State University. Uh, it's called PEACE, Promoting Empathy, Awareness, and Compassion in Education. And we've been doing a series of randomized trials on mindfulness for teachers, mindfulness for parents, and mindfulness for children. And um, these are very complex topics. Each one of them I could talk to you on for, for hours. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a Cook's tour of some of the work on the mindfulness for teachers and some of the work on uh, yoga with children. So for me, this was important. To think out of the box. Um, uh, mindfulness, if, 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 I, if I had written a grant to my federal agencies in, uh, in, in the 90s, uh, proposing to do a study of the effects of yoga on children and the effect of mindfulness on parents, I wouldn't even gotten, I would have been screened out before it even got reviewed. It was seen as a, not a legitimate area of research. It's only recently, in the last few years, that, uh, that governments are interested in funding these, this kind of work, and I think it's partly because of the desperation of modern life. The kinds of things we've been talking about the last day and a half, the stresses, the multitasking, the lack of, of awareness that many people have, the real concern we have about uh, mental, mental illness and uh, the growth of children has led us to try new ideas. Uh, and uh, I've been lucky enough to work with a great group of scientists to, uh, to work on some of these new ideas around mindfulness. So what is it? Well, Alan talked about it a little bit yesterday. John Kabat-Zinn, as you probably know, who developed mindfulness-based stress response, is very, uh, was a very important figure in secularizing mindfulness. He said it's paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, intentionally, uh, in the present moment without judgment. It's just being present in the moment. Well, that's part of the definition of mindfulness, and uh, there's much, much more to it, actually. And uh, there's been quite a lot of writing on this, of course, for the last 3,000 years. Uh, and mindfulness actually means remembering. It's not just being present in the moment, but remembering. And you can see John has revised his, his definition recently. He said, an awareness of one's conduct and the quality of one's relationships are intrinsic elements of the cultivation of mindfulness. It's not just about being present in the moment and watching your breath or sitting on a pillow. Okay? That's the easy part of it. The hard part of it is bringing your mindfulness into your everyday life in your interactions with others. Don't you all know people that have gone to meditation retreats and sat on a pillow for a couple of days and come home and screamed at their partners? <laughs> right? right? Don't you know many people that you would say are very mindful, caring, and compassionate that have never meditated? Right? So we don't want to confuse these two things. Uh, there are many ways of being mindful. Uh, there are many ways of becoming mindful. Art, literature, music, many ways of doing it. Meditation and yoga are two ways that have had uh, privilege. They've been privileged in the kind of work that mostly has been done recently. But it's a much broader field than that. And to really talk about mindfulness, I am saying then that we have to talk about ethics at the same time. 
Because engaging in mindful awareness means not only being aware in the present, but it means reflecting on living a set of ethics, including not to harm others and to engage in wholesome actions. This is just as important as being in the present moment. And this involves being able to recollect and reflect on one's actions with discrimination, evaluation, and mature judgment, rather than being reactive in the moment. Okay? So it's more than just being present in the moment. It's bringing everything you have together to be the, your, your best in that very, very present moment. And this allows what we call things like right view, right effort, right speech, right concentration, right action, right livelihood. This is the eightfold path in the Buddhist model. Right? It's a lot more than just sitting on a pillow, watching your breath, learning to relax. Right? It's really about what kind of person you are and what kind of person you, you want to be in the world. So we're very interested in this. This field has grown dramatically. This is the uh, recent chart of peer-reviewed scientific articles, only in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and you can see the dramatic rise in the study of mindfulness, meditation, and yoga in the last decade. Literally in 2005, there wasn't even a single study published for, on children or adolescents. There were some on adults, and you can see the dramatic rise in growth in this field. We are learning a lot quickly, but the field is incredibly young, and we don't know much yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CARE. CARE is a, 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 a model that we've been using, uh, developed by Tish Jennings and Krista, my wife, who will do a workshop with me tomorrow, and Richard Brown. It stands for Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education. You might notice we don't use the word mindfulness or meditation, uh, because those are words that are not very secular these days, in which there's often concerns about what they mean and where they come from. We're very interested in this issue of the burnout cascade uh, that uh, Alan talked yesterday about the issue of uh, uh, rumination. And uh, if you're a parent, how many of you are parents in this room? Most of you. How many times have you felt, uh, I'm sure you felt at a time in which your children were out to get you? They were doing things intentionally to hurt you. Now imagine you're a teacher and you've got 30 kids intentionally out to get you every day, right? When you have the mindset when you're ruminating that children are out to ruin your day, rather than children have needs that they're trying to express and what you need to understand, two very different views of the same event, uh, you're likely to start to burn out. And that means you begin to have this emotional exhaustion from the stress of the work you're doing. You often then begin to depersonalize people. So the teachers often fall into the trap of depersonalizing their students. The student is really out to get me. He, he, he's intentionally being mean. She's intentionally ruining my lesson. And when that happens, teachers begin to feel a lack of accomplishment, a lack of efficacy as teaching, and they often stop teaching. In fact, in, uh, in the United States, somewhere around 50% of teachers leave the profession every five years. 50% okay, of teachers that started five years later are gone. We've just been in Croatia and Israel, and the statistics are very similar. I don't know what they are in Australia. But we have an incredible loss of human social capital. We're training many, many people who start to become teachers because of their love of children and their desire to become a teacher that nurtures children's development. And within five years, half of them are leaving the profession. Okay. So we have a crisis. We have a social capital crisis. It affects lots of aspects of our society. So it's not just children that we're interested in and their mindfulness, but the mindfulness of adults around them and especially teachers. So in CARE, our aims are to uh, increase teachers' mindfulness, their ability to be caring and compassionate, present in the moment when they're with children, to have more positive affect, uh, to increase their enjoyment, their efficacy of teaching, to decrease, of course, their burnout and their negative affect. Teachers have a very high rate of depression. In fact, there's a study in Germany looking at the cortisol levels of teachers across the day, and many teachers have a profile much like Romanian orphans. They don't, their, their, their cortisol is not restored at night by their sleep. Alan talked about the problem of sleep and rumination. And so at, at the start of the day, a, a typical person in this room starts out with high cortisol levels and they drop during the day. But Romanian orphans and other highly stressed populations, including teachers in Germany, don't show that rise during the night and they start out at very low levels across the entire day. Okay? It's a measure of stress and the stress in the system that they're experiencing. So in CARE, we do a number of different things. Uh, we, we help teachers become more aware of their own emotions, and we'll talk about some of these tomorrow in the workshop, how we do this. We help them to understand the triggers they have that, that lead them to, to uh, especially become, uh, become angry or sad. 
We teach them all kinds of mindfulness practices, including sitting and walking meditation and loving kindness meditations. Uh, we call them caring practices. And we teach them how to listen. Alan talked yesterday about the importance of attention, that attention is the most important thing you can give to a person. And, and we spend time with them, teaching them how to really listen to other people. This is a, not an easy thing to do. And we teach that through, uh, through practices, role plays, and uh, this is done over time. We usually do two days of uh, retreat, and then one day a couple weeks later, one day a couple weeks later, and then a booster. And in between, they have phone coaching, so they, we can talk to them about how's it going, how are they applying what they learned uh, in, the, in the retreat to their everyday work with the classroom. We've done one randomized trial, uh, so this is still a promissory note, as I said, it's, it's all new work. Uh, in which we had 50 teachers in urban and suburban public schools in the state of Pennsylvania, and of course, most women. And uh, we randomized them and gave half of them the uh, care program, and half of them uh, didn't receive it. Actually, they were able to receive it, of course, later. And what you can see is significant changes in their sense of self-efficacy. The, the blue is the, uh, is the intervention teachers, starting out at pretty much the same place, but across a school year, usually, uh, you know across a school year how it goes? <laughs> and you teachers, you know that the start of the year is a lot of energy and motivation, and by about the, by the springtime, uh, everyone is antsy. Uh, schools are spending a lot of time on testing and then field trips, and classrooms begin to deteriorate, and people become uh, very antsy and, uh, and, and whinge a lot, as you would say, <laughs> and are unhappy. So that's what you see across the year, that the teaching efficacy of, of, of the control teachers went down a little bit, but it actually rose in those teachers that had the care program. We looked at their stress, their sense of stress and urgency of time, and what you can see again is it's going up a bit in the control group. Their sense of stress and urgency across the years is, is, is getting worse, and in the teachers that learn these mindfulness techniques, it's going down. Very important is daily physical symptoms. These are symptoms of uh, headaches and stomach aches and uh, uh, somatic pains, et cetera. And what you can see is a, 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 a significant and important drop in the number of physical symptoms. This is very important because health care issues for teachers are very important. One of the reasons why they're, they're not returning to work, why 50% of them are leaving, is because of the stress is affecting their, their, their physical bodies. And lastly, what you see is a, a really dramatic rise in their personal accomplishment, their sense that they are accomplishing what they want as teachers. And this relates to a, a talk Robert had this morning about passion, what it means to feel that passion and feel that sense of personal accomplishment. Here's what one of the teachers said after the workshop. She said, I'm being more aware of the kids, more opportunities to talk with them, just more aware in general of myself, what I'm feeling, what I'm eating, what I'm doing, where I'm going. My awareness has just been heightened. And if I can just keep reminding myself of that, that's the issue, rem reminding, uh, just to be aware, aware of other people, aware of my own stuff, that's a huge thing in my life. Okay? Just becoming more aware. And one of the uh, things that we have teachers do is set intentions. Uh, 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 for example, at the beginning of the day, we might ask a teacher to set an intention of how they'd like their day to go, just to become more consciously aware of what their, their day will be like. And here's a teacher who says, I think what help, helps me is when I get frustrated on my way to school, I just stop myself and set an intention. What do I really want to do today? Okay. What's really important that I can do today? It's more freeing than setting a, a, a set of goals or a to-do list. Or another teacher talked about what we call decentering, which is often talked about in the mindfulness literature or self-regulation. She just said, I'm much more calm. Even when I'm home drinking coffee, my mind is not racing in a thousand different directions. I'm just liking my coffee, right? How many of us actually do that? Where we're not trying to do three things, we don't have our phone on, we're not doing other things, we're just enjoying one act at a time. That's what Alan talked about yesterday, about this, this uh, multitasked world of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, in which we, we are all trying to do many things at once and nothing with much attention. She says, I'm just liking my coffee. I've learned how to take things for what they are and not keep everything on my shoulders all the time. And because I'm not doing that anymore, it allows me to treat my kids better and address their needs better and try and teach them to be the, the, that way through my own example. The teacher sees themselves as an example of how to become more mindful of themselves. So that's the kind of work we've been doing with teachers. We find it very uh, stimulating. Uh, uh, and uh, we now have a large randomized trial with a... Uh, 300, almost 300 teachers in the New York City schools that's uh, just beginning. And uh, 
there's a, there's a cry, there's a crying out that we get a sense of from teachers that, um, that everything that's done is for children and nothing is done for them. And when they're offered something like care, they grasp at it because finally there's something to help them pr- uh, improve their own professional and personal development, not just curriculum for children. So let me go to kids now. Uh, yoga for kids. I Googled, Googled it when I gave a speech in Vancouver in February 2011. I had 21 million hits. And uh, I Googled it last night at 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> about then, 162 million hits. Okay? So everywhere you go, you see work now on yoga for children. Right? Yoga was mostly for adults until about 5 to 10 years ago. Every community in, in, in America, every community in England, every community in Germany, I bet you almost every community in Australia, I saw an article in the Australian Age just uh, last week, uh, are doing yoga with kids. Okay? So that's interesting. Uh, what effects will it have? Well, we don't know. We have no idea what effects it will have. But if you go on the websites, you'll see unbelievable claims of the kinds of things that it will do, with literally no evidence at this point at all. And I'm going to tell you about the first published study ever done in the world on yoga with normal, everyday children in a school. Okay? So, is there only, only is one published so far? So that's how new uh, and, and, uh, and uncharted this territory is. This is a study with my colleagues in Baltimore, Maryland. And my colleagues there, Ali Atman and Andy, who are, run the Holistic Life Foundation. They're African-American Puerto Rican men uh, who uh, got into yoga and stress reduction and mindfulness themselves and began to work with schools. We met and we decided to do work together. And the question we had is, can yoga and mindfulness support the development of children to improve their coping and their attention? Remember, Alan talking about attention yesterday as the most important characteristic. And when children attend, of course, they don't get in trouble in the classroom. So we did a pilot randomized control trial. These are children in very low-income neighborhoods in Baltimore, Maryland. It's a very high-stress area in which it's estimated that 25% of the adults in the neighborhood are HIV drug users. Really very high risk, as, as high risk as you can imagine. Anybody seen The Wire? The, the Wire TV show is filmed in, these, in this very neighborhood. So we were interested in how these mindfulness approaches might enhance resilience and coping uh, to help children manage the stress and their attentional capacities. Uh, we took four schools in inner-city Baltimore. We randomized uh, the children in fourth and fifth grade, so two schools got the intervention and two schools didn't. And uh, the yogis, as they call them, the travel yogis, did uh, yoga four days a week for about a half an hour for 12 weeks. So the kids came out of the classroom, and their parents consented, of course. It's a research project. And uh, they did yoga. And the yoga was progressing from simple to more complex yogic postures. Uh, uh, so have you, you, you tried downward dog? How many of you can actually do downward dog? <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> but the kids try, and what happens is they get into it. They get into these exercises because they're sensory motor. They're children, and they're physical, and they love it. And in fact, when I join, they try to teach me how to do it. And then they, their heart rates are up, they're sweating, and then they lie down in the, what we call the corpse position, just flat on their yoga mat, in, in the, it's often called shav- the shavasana position. And that's the goal. The goal is to get them into a place in which there's silence and they're relaxing into their own awareness. Right? And the yoga postures and the activity get them to that point. And then the mindfulness training is a guided set of experiences in which children lie on their mats, and we help their minds focus maybe on their breath some days, or some days on sensations, sometimes maybe like a candle in their heart. Other days we do what we call loving kindness meditations where they send out love to their, their mothers and their friends and their school and their community. So we've been looking at self-regulation in the first project and what you can see here is a significant effect that the children that uh, self-report, that uh, those that, that were randomized to get the yoga, no other differences in, in these children, that they improve in their self-regulation while the control kids decrease. Again, across the school year, things always get worse for behavior. And these changes in self-regulation are exactly in the areas that Alan talked about yesterday that are the sort of the issues that plague us as humans, but especially people that live under very stressful conditions and especially children who don't have control over those stressful conditions. And those are rumination. Here's an example of a question that uh, that, that changed for the children. When I have problems with other kids, I can't stop thinking about them. You could say the same thing. When I'm having problems at work, I can't sleep at night, right? I'm thinking about the problem. Emotional arousal. When I have problems with other kids, right away I feel angry, scared, 
uh, sad or worried. And the issue of intrusive thoughts, thoughts they can't control that are intruding on their ability to pay attention and be aware. When I have problems with other kids, I can't stop thinking about them. And when I try to sleep, I have bad dreams about them. Okay? And these are the precursors, we know, these kinds of characteristics of the development of anxiety and depression in adolescence. So by doing this work, we believe that we're reducing, especially in children in very high-stress situations, their risk of becoming anxious and depressed. And kids talk about this, of course, in their own language. This one child said, the program has helped me because now I know different routines and exercises that I can do at home that help me lower and reduce my stress. Sounds like an adult, doesn't it? So whenever I get stressed out, I can just do a pose. And sometimes I can show my mom and my family. Most important thing I learned is that it's all different ways to deal with your stress, like instead of just fighting and stuff. Right? And it helps you relieve stress when you really feel stressed out or you really feel mad and focus on what's inside of you and make sure that you stay calm. Right? It's coming to that inner, inner quiet self that I think that Amy will spend time talking about in her own talk. So um, what, what, as a scientist, this is great. Right? We've shown, I've shown you two very preliminary studies post-test only, no follow-up over five years, that show that we can teach teachers, we can nurture teachers' mindfulness and improves their functioning, reduces their, their daily physical symptoms and their enjoyment of the classroom. And we, we've done work with yoga with kids showing that it reduces their risk for anxiety and depression. But what are the active ingredients in these different pr practices? Uh, and I, we don't know much about this yet, really. There's really three components, I think. There are the practices themselves. This is what, basically what the Buddha said. There's the practices. Like, like meditation, different kinds of meditation practice. There's what we call the dharma, or the worldview. And there's the sangha, or the community. And these three are interacting together. Right? So if you go to a church service, it doesn't matter what religion you go to. It could be Islam, or uh, Lutheran, or Protestant, Catholic. You're going to always see these three practices. You're going to have practices, some kind of prayers, songs, singing. Right? You're going to have a, a, a sermon. Right? A dharma, a worldview orientation for what the meaning of, of this, these practices are and how they help us to care for each other. And you're going to have a community that holds that together. Okay? Now, we don't know how much each of these things is, uh, is worth in terms of the value. It may be that the practices are not that important. And what's really important is the dharma and the community. For some people, it may be the practices are very important. For some people, it's learning an ethics or a worldview that's important. And part of the next, I think, uh, decade of work is to understand how these things work. What practices do what, uh, how it is that a worldview or an orientation uh, affects people's uh, development. Uh, you know there are people who are, as I said earlier, mindful who never meditate, and people who meditate that aren't mindful. Right? So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence here. It's a much larger and richer and deeper picture. So what can these practices do? I'm quite positive about them, as you can tell. And at the same time, I have reservations as a scientist not going too far. We know little about their effects on children at different stages in development. Amy may talk about this a little bit, but working with a 5-year-old and working with a 14-year-old with a is very different. And their, their, their ability to be metacognitive, to reflect on themselves, to reflect on the reflection of themselves, et cetera, grows across time. We don't know much about what techniques would be, uh, might be more effective or less effective at different ages. And, and then we don't know much about the different practices. So for example, just teaching children breathing is different than doing yoga. And we know that compassion-focused meditations are very different than attention-focused meditations. And we know little about what the differential effects of these are on different children. And yet, if you go on the websites, you'll see that uh, the claims are that these techniques will do everything for everyone. And we know that's not the case. We know that there will be lots of individual differences we need to understand. So when we take a step back from that, what can we say? What we can say mostly is we want to build nurturing environments for children. And uh, many schools are not places where children feel nurtured. And that's true in Australia as well as in the rest of the world. There's much to be learned about how to promote a nurturing environment in which both children and adults act in mindful ways with each other in caring ways. And I think the most important thing we can do right now is helping adults to become more mindful. That's the most essential thing. Because when adults themselves uh, have this kind of mindfulness, and that is being present in a moment in a way in which they listen deeply to children, they model compassionate behavior, uh, and they're, they, they're able to regulate their emotions effectively, including positive emotions, children are going to learn that. 
They're going to learn it as, as, as they learn everything else in this osmosis of modeling that children have. When children grow up in aggressive families, what happens? They become more aggressive. When children come up in more mindful and caring families with warm, loving context in which people are mindful to each other, they're much more likely to be mindful. So while we can teach children directly these skills, and I'm a great advocate for learning how to do that better, right now I think the most important thing that we can do is help parents and teachers become more mindful themselves. And that will then translate into changes uh, in, in children's development. So I just want to end with a quote of Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn is actually the, uh, who's a, a revisionist historian who actually is the father-in-law of John Cabot Zinn, although that's just by chance here. But uh, these, these are not good times, I think, for many ways in the world. And the, the work I do with children, I work with many children and adults that are suffering greatly. And I think Howard Zinn's quote is very important. He said, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but of, also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. And that's very much what's been happening, I think, in this meeting, especially yesterday, what we choose to emphasize. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember the times and places, and there are many, where people have behaved magnificently, like the nature of books as Richard was talking about, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however a small way, we don't have to wait for some grand, grand utopian future. We don't have to reform schools completely. The future is an infinite succession of presence. That's a very mindful statement. An infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us, it is itself a marvelous victory. That is, it's the personal action every day of the small acts of life, of caring and compassion, that we can do as adults for children and adults for ourselves that, in fact, make up the nature and fabric of our world. So thank you.